Welcome everyone, just some quick housekeeping before we get started, just to let everyone know the event is being live streamed and recorded. Uh, and if you have any questions to submit, please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen if you're using a computer to submit your questions and make sure to include your name and organization if relevant. And without further ado, I'll hand over to our Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee. Thanks a million, Neil. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And firstly, just to say a sincere thanks to everyone who's joined us. I'm delighted we have so many who've tuned in for the next hour uh, for our roundtable discussion with a particular focus today on International Women's Day on the justice sector. And I want to start by just wishing everyone a happy International Women's Day. This is, I think, a day that has really grown in prominence and focus over the last number of years. And it's a day where we can celebrate the many wonderful women in our lives, first and foremost, those who have supported us and shaped us and helped turn us into the, the people we are today, but also not just those who are close to us, our family, our, our friends, those who we work with, but those who we've never met, uh, those who we'll probably never meet, and those who have over the years shaped the society that we live in, those who have been trailblazers and who have paved the way for so many of us. Um, and we've seen many of them in the video that we've just watched there. And thankfully we have some of them as well uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, this year's theme for International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge. And I think really it is, it's laying the gauntlet down for each and every one of us. What can we do um, to challenge ourselves, but whether it's in the next week, the next, month, the next year, what can we do to make lives better for the, the women and girls who will come after us? Uh, and it's something I'm, I'm going to ask our, our panellists later on, but um, I feel very lucky to be Minister for Justice at a time when we have some wonderful women working in the justice sector. And I often think uh, it's a little bit like politics where um, for many, many years, men have been to the fore and have held many of the senior positions and, and the, the more prominent roles, but women have always been there. They have been hardworking, determined, ambitious, perhaps not given those same opportunities. And thankfully, that is changing. And we are joined by five wonderful women this afternoon who really are uh, to the fore of, of bringing about that change. We have Una McPhillips, uh, our Secretary General in the Department of Justice, Anne-Marie McMahon, who is Deputy Commissioner in Angara the Shiakana, Angela Denning, who is uh, CEO of the Court Service, Maeve Hogan, CEO of the Property Services Regulatory Authority, and Dr Linda Mulligan, our Chief State Pathologist. So thank you to each and every one of you for joining us. Uh, and I'm really looking forward just to maybe getting a little bit of an insight into the work that you are doing and, and perhaps maybe the barriers that you faced along the way, but also your, your insights and your advice to the many women and girls who, who are coming after you as well. Um, and of course, as Neil said, really want to hear from everybody else. And, and if you have questions uh, to make sure that you, you send them through to our Q&A and I'll try and get through them as well uh, as everything else. So perhaps maybe if, if I could start with you, Una. Um, Una, you were appointed Secretary General to the Department of Justice last year. You were the first female Secretary General, which uh, is wonderful, but I do hope we get to a point very soon where we don't have to celebrate these kind of firsts. But while we are, um, I just want to congratulate you and, and uh, wish you continued success. But you said something very interesting when uh, you were appointed last year, and that was, you know, while you've worked in the Department of Environment and the Shikon and the Oris, you've spent most of your career in the Department of Justice and you've seen many capable women who perhaps at a different time or who were given the opportunity would have achieved the, the, the highest position. So I'm just wondering, has that influenced you along your career? Is, you know, is the position of Secretary General something that you always aspired to, or is it something perhaps that you felt was possible given the fact that you had seen a glass ceiling put on front of many other women in, in, in the department throughout those years? Thanks, Minister. And it's, it's great to be here today with so many colleagues and, and with a female minister as well. So it's a, it's a lovely day and it's a lovely way to celebrate and to challenge ourselves uh, as the theme goes. Um, no, I, I don't think uh, I've ever had, a, I've never had a plan. I never had a, 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 a burning ambition or didn't really seem an option. I came in as a school leaver just after my 18th birthday and uh, it, it, it really wasn't something that I raised my sights to at that point. 
But um, when you talk about previous um, colleagues, I, there were there were very many women in the department over the years, some of them at, at a relatively senior level at principal officer. I could still name them 30 years ago. There were three of them and they were really fantastic. And, and you know, looking back on it, they, they could have achieved anything. But it, it, it just whether it, whether it was oppor- lack of opportunity or a lack of confidence or lack of encouragement, because certainly in my own case, I got an awful lot of, of encouragement um, from colleagues and from from women colleagues, but also from men as well who really encouraged me and uh, gave me opportunities and I took them all and I I always think as well of my own family as well because my mother was one of six sisters and they were very strong role models to have in your family like they were opinionated and they were argumentative and they had confidence and they were all homemakers and they all they all worked in in their homes uh, most of their lives but they they were tremendous uh, role models for myself and my sister and my cousins as well. So I know you had that in your own family too, where where you had people encouraging you along the way. Um, so it's funny. I, I definitely think that that the the opportunities that are available to us now are much more equal. But I think we have to strive all the time. So at the moment, I, I mentioned about the three principal officers there in the past, but now we're at fifty fifty in in PO AP. Uh, assistant principal which is the, the the pipeline for a principal officer and also at the management board and we we had a majority of women last week but we we had a man appointed uh, on friday so he evened up the the scales for for uh, the gender balance so we're at 50 50 on the management board um uh, at the moment but keeping it that way is going to be a, an a, an ongoing uh, effort and i think it, it behoves us all really especially uh, and i suppose a lot of us would have you know, should we do this thing today or, you know, God, you know, putting yourself forward. But we do have a responsibility as, as senior women in, in our organisations to be role models and to, to make it possible for to, to, for people to try and, and be what they can see. Uh, and in my own case, that, that's somebody who came in at the very entry level, got all my education as a civil servant and uh, was blessed to do so. And so do you think in, in your position now, um, how do you ensure that there is continue, you know, as you said, the Department of Justice is doing quite well at the moment. It's not necessarily reflected across all of the departments. So how do we ensure that we have that greater parity across all departments uh, m- moving forward? I do think it comes down to the one to one conversations between people with with their direct reports and their line managers. That, that you have to manage everybody differently and everybody as individuals. And I, I say that in relation to men and women, but especially women. So quite often I, I will say to, to colleagues, is so-and-so not going to apply for that job or did that person not apply? And they'd say, oh, she's not ready. She doesn't, she doesn't want to. And I kind of go a little bit deeper. And how how was that? How did that conversation go? You know, so were you, were you encouraging or were you just asking, are you going to do it? You know? Because for every job I ever went for, I needed encouragement and uh, sometimes I needed a good shove. And uh, it's funny, I was listening to Catherine Day earlier on the Civil Service uh, Women's Network and she was saying the exact same thing when she was asked to, to apply for a director general of the European Commission. She was like, I'm not ready. And I remember uh, Susan Denham saying the same thing to me when she when she was asked to apply for the Supreme Court. Uh, she was like, oh, no, not for me. So we, we do, even those really accomplished, successful people needed the shove. And it's down to us all as managers to do that. And you have to do that one to one. This, you know, you, you can do it in forums like this, but you do have to have those conversations. It's unfortunate that we're still in a position where even though we, we, we have equal numbers in many areas and we have the, the law and we have the, 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 the legislative supports there where there is inequality, it doesn't always, uh, it doesn't always happen in practice and, and that encouragement is still needed. But in the department itself, maybe, um, obviously, and I've seen it myself be, being there for the last number of months, it is a department that plays such a significant role in helping to bring about greater equality. And I'm just wondering for you, what are the, the priority areas, the policy areas that, that you would like to progress as, as Secretary General over the coming years? So, yeah, no, it's a great question. We, we I suppose we have all of our uh, national strategies that we play our role in. So we, we have, even though uh, the equality brief has gone from us, we have a really strong role in relation to the strategy for women and girls and obviously the, the national strategy on prevention of um, domestic domestic sexual and gender-based violence. So we have our obligations under those. So we have a real opportunity to influence the lives of vulnerable women, um, women coming before the courts. Uh, I, I, I saw a, a really brave woman um, ex- telling her story in the over the weekend of her experience in relation to um, 
to you know prosecution in, in an assault case and you know we have we have power our pens and our policy in relation to those things so I think in challenging ourselves in relation to careers and bringing forward women in, in the department we also have the the option and the, the responsibility to to do as much as we can to help um to help women through our work so the the current um the current pro policy priority is in relation to um the domestic abuse and we've taken that very much to heart over the last 12 months we really asked ourselves this time last year I can remember having a conversation with NGOs in March of last year around domestic abuse and what the pandemic was going to mean to them and uh, how how it was going to affect uh, the most vulnerable women in our society and uh, we we really put our backs into that uh, as a sector over the last uh, year and uh, Angela's organization and Amaris and uh, and others prioritised that the, the listing of domestic abuse cases, prioritised prevention, and we'll continue to do that. But there's more to do in that space as well. And the, the O'Malley report gave us a really good roadmap in relation to making the, the victim's experience a much more, um, well, a much less damaging one, I suppose, where, where victims felt re-traumatised by their, their, their experience going through the process. So we have a range of, of actions that we have to do to, to, to combat that. And we'll be doing that as a priority. And you mentioned obviously the, the court service and, and in particular looking at the issue of domestic violence and, and unfortunately something that impacts women more um, than men. But Angela, you, you have, you're, you're another first, you're the, the first um, female CEO of the court service. And I know you've spent most of your career either working in, in court operations or in, in that environment, but um, you, you've obviously seen a huge amount of change over those years but you yourself are now driving change. And, and I was reading, you, you said recently that the Irish courts are in the middle of the greatest tech experiment ever, something which, which you're obviously driving as well. And I'm just wondering, how do you see that as a way to, to improve, not just, um, I suppose, the, the, those who are working within the, the court service, but also those who use the court service and, and their experience, in particular women, maybe if, if we're looking at domestic violence. Yeah, I suppose if you look at it, technology can be a great leveler um, where people have access to it. So if you look at um, the OECD, for example, and, and uh, the World Bank have done surveys on how technology can be used to lift boats where, people, where there is inequality, um, as long as you can have access to it. And I suppose that's the key for us. It's how do we, we introduce technology in a way that doesn't create further barriers um, so if you look at um, just access to the courts, um, Una spoke there earlier about the, the Still Here campaign that was, has, been, has run continually through COVID. We have done um, remote courts where women have been able to apply for protection orders from their own homes where they couldn't leave their homes because they were um, under COVID restrictions, the 14 days where somebody in the house had tested positive. Um, and, and that has allowed people to still have access to justice, but we have to be very careful about it. It's not going to be a panacea for everything. I'm very aware of that. And I'm very aware of the people who, who don't have access to technology. My own mother doesn't use either a mobile phone. She can barely manage the remote control. So we still have to account for people like that, but it can be a great leveler if it's used properly and it, it can be used to give people access and to make access easier for people. Um, we look at Peter Kelly's report, which published recently about civil reform with 140 something recommendations in it. And a lot of those are about making things simpler and making things easier for people who need to access the courts. And I think that's where our priority will be before we add the technological layer on top of it. So it's about reducing those 900 forms that we have on the civil side of the house, for example, down to well, maybe not 900. If we, if we can start and maybe get it down to five or 600 in English, that would be of great assistance to people. And then to add the technological layer on top. But certainly that's where I see us moving, that um, technology can be a great lever. And if you look at during COVID, um, we have realised, because people have had to work from home, for example, that assistant principal officers, principal officers, assistant secretaries do not need to be in the office five days a week that there's additional flexibility that can be brought in. And Una spoke there earlier about some of the barriers that women encounter. And if you look at the demographic profile of people as they get to the more senior levels in the public service, um, women tend to opt out at certain times because they have children at home or they're caring for 
elderly relatives or so on. And there's a kind of a, a pinch period, usually in their 40s, where they have both. So they have children at home and they have elderly parents. And technology can assist with that as well. That it, you know, if we have more flexibility around our working week, I think that can absolutely assist people as well. And maybe um, when we have those conversations with people and say to them, well, you know, would you not think of throwing your, ring, your name in the hat there for such and such a competition, that we're not so hard and fast anymore about you know principal officers have to work five days a week or whatever it might be i think i see it certainly as part of our people and organization strategy going into the future about it being enabling to allow people to make those decisions about their careers at a time that best suits them um women are joining the civil service at an older age now so after their children have have left home and so on they're rejo rejoining the workforce and it's about enabling that and making sure then that people can progress quickly and I suppose what you're talking about is how we can improve things going forward. But, you know, looking at how things have progressed over the, the years and, you know, looking at our video at the beginning, 1921, the first female called to the bar and you see quite long stretches before you see yeah. the first of the things happening. But, um, you know, do, do you think that women maybe have had to make more sacrifices over the years working in this space to, to be able to get ahead um, and is that something that we can maybe address in, in the ways that you've just outlined? Now? Yeah, I, I think um, it has been very difficult for, for people. And I think part of it was, was certainly, I remember speaking to one of my um, managers here when I was much younger, um, was Deirdre Farrell, who was the probate officer. And she was the first uh, woman to stay in the civil service after the marriage ban in the courts. And she's at her retirement, she spoke to me and said how she had felt under pressure almost for her entire career not to let the team down because she knew that when she had her first child, everybody was watching to see, would she be looking for time off, off now to go to school appointments or would she be looking for, you know, a half day here if a child was sick or whatever it might be. And she was very conscious of that and that she was a leader. And I suppose women have had to battle that. If you like, you'd hear horror stories from the professions at times of women being back in court within a few days of having children because they, they feel that they can't, if they, if they take time off, take the time that they would have liked to take, that they could be adversely penalised for that. And I'm, I, I think I'm pleased to say that those barriers are coming down all of the time. We now see in the way that COVID has taught us, the principal officers don't need to be in the, in the building five days a week. We now see that, um, you know, I suppose it's from experience that people, people see the change, but it's surprising Maura McNally is the chair of the Bar Council. She's only the second female chair and yet more than half the profession are female. So um, that's the ch that challenge is still there that, um, and, and maybe it is that, you know, there's that self-confidence, I don't know, do you call it self-confidence either? Certainly, you know, Una spoke about it there, but the th actually throwing your ring in the hat going, am I ready, am I not? And I, you know, somebody said to me, if you don't apply for that job, I'll never speak to you again. And that, that was part of what made me apply for the job. But is there that thing of, of, you know, a fear of failure, maybe that girls have that boys don't have that, um, you know, it, the difference between trying to get everything right as, or, you know, is it a fear of failure and that the getting yourself back up again, dusting yourself down after you do fail and going, well, I've learned from that and move on. I think that's part of the challenge as well. But it's it's certainly, um, it's been very, very difficult. And I'm very, very grateful to all the women who went before me. Um, like if you look at the gaps that there were the whole way through the first, we now have the first female president of the High Court, for example, that's taken a hundred years, um, despite all the numbers of women who are in the professions. And do you think maybe International Women's Day is uh, is important in just even highlighting these issues? Obviously, we want to be championing women and, and progress every single day. But do you see it as an important day even just to, to highlight these and then to have us, you know, place a greater emphasis throughout the year? You know, the team this year choose to challenge, get all thinking, what can we do in the year ahead to, to, to implement change? Yeah, I think it's important to, to continue to reinforce the message and to send the message out there to girls who are starting off in their careers that to reinforce to them that they shouldn't see, you know, what could be perceived by some as a barrier isn't a barrier. It's just something else to be worked through and to work around. Um, and 
I think that's it is about reinforcing that message and showing other women that you can succeed and you can succeed in your own way that you don't have to I think over the years women almost tried to behave like men in order to succeed in a man's world and that you don't need to do that um that time has changed and that you can uh, as my little eight-year-old niece would say you can still be a girl one and and get on and succeed and and it is about that it's, it's about um reinforcing the messages showing that we are willing to change things that we see that are wrong that could be barriers for people um you know making things easier for people when they do come back from their maternity leave or if they come back from a career break after taking time off to care for people just making sure that people um come back into the workforce well and that they feel appreciated and that's built into how we deal with our policies and our strategies and so on i suppose it's the old adage saying you you can't be what you can't see so you need exactly to highlight that constantly and um Anne-Marie if I could come to you because you're 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 34 years um in Langar the Shiakana and you joined at a time perhaps maybe where there weren't really too many women joining Langar the Shiakana it was perhaps maybe a, a more difficult environment to work in or perhaps yeah. not but I'm just interested in 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 who or, or what inspired you to to choose a career in Langar the Shiakana at the time. Hey, uh, thanks, Minister. So I suppose it's um, it was something I always wanted to do. I can't really say there was any particular reason. Um, there were a number of people um, that I knew, males, of course, uh, had joined on Garda Shiakana and um, but there wasn't anything in particular from a female perspective. I just didn't see, well, why not? You know, I kind of thought, you know, this is something I'd like to do and I went for it. And but at that time in 1986, when I joined, uh, women were still very much uh, in the minority. Um, you know, in, in the bigger cities and towns, there were a number of female guards. But in many instances throughout the country, uh, we were still very much a novelty. And, um, you know, if there was a new vanguard, as we were called at that point in time, you know, it was very much local news and all that sort of thing, you know. But, you know, I think... Things have come a long way. We are now at 27% uh, in terms of the overall uh, makeup of the organization, which is quite good, ahead of our European counterparts. And we have uh, women at, you know, at every grade, really, at some point uh, along the way, and, uh, and in many instances, leading the way. Uh, I would also say, you know, last year, or sorry, in 2019, we celebrated uh, 60 years uh, since women first uh, joined the Garda Shikana. And looking back at the all debates and all the discussion and all the work that the the, the women advocate groups uh, had to do in order to to make it happen that um, women joined a Garda Shikona, it's quite staggering, really, to be honest about it. You know, when you look at it from a twenty twenty one uh, perspective. But look, there have been lots of, I suppose, ups and downs along the way. Uh, there's been uh, lots of firsts, you know, from the first, the first 12 females in, in 1959, but then there were the first uh, women who went into to branch various other roles and sergeants and, and inspectors and all the way up the ranks, you know, so it, it wasn't easy for them. And I suppose, you know, as, as being alluded to, um, the challenge always is um, balancing, you know, childcare and a career and, uh, you know, the guilt that goes with that. Um, and and it's never easy, but I suppose you just have to be really organised. And it is possible, I suppose. Uh, that's the one thing that, you know, that I would like to say is it is possible to combine both. You need support and you need to be highly organised. And there were probably a few years, again, this has been, been referenced by, by Angela, um, you know, that you do need a little bit extra support really when children are very young and um, and there are sleepless nights and there's all sorts of things like that that really good childcare won't even cater for. You know, it's just, you know, this is part of the journey that you have to go through. So I would say, you know, once you get over those few years, things do get better. And, um, you know, but the acknowledgement, I suppose, and I think, you know, you're asking the question, well, what can we do? I think we have to acknowledge that that is part of life um, and, um, you know, it's something that, that, that will come and it'll go. And it's just about, you know, being a little bit patient for a very short period of time. 
And uh, because I think if you, you know, put your career on hold indefinitely, well, then it will be indefinite, you know. So I think it's about trying to nudge along. And it doesn't always have to be about upward movement. It can be lateral movement that can be equally as fulfilling and giving you that diversity of role and that motivation. And you're also bringing your own, your own, uh, I suppose, expertise and style and all the rest of it. And I suppose the, the, the female perspective is important no matter, no matter what walk of life you're in. But I would say it's really important in, in the justice sector and uh, in particular in policing. Uh, it's part of that diversity that we're also eager to encourage and embrace and uh, you know, and for young girls uh, looking in, I think it's a, you know there's lots of career opportunities, and it's not just joining the guards as as in the the, the police service, but there are also a lot of opportunities for guard the staff, both in specialist and generalist roles. And as we move forward, those roles will become more operational and more hands on. So I do think that there's a greater spread of opportunity that presents now vis-a-vis what was possible or could even be envisaged years ago. So I think I think the future is bright, to be fair. And and on that, because I mean you you are obviously in your 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 current position and your, your position as deputy commissioner, um you're a role model to, to many young women, but in particular those who are either joining or thinking of joining um on Garda Khan. And I suppose do you see your new position now as as a platform or an opportunity to 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 encourage even more. I know that you, you had worked at, or you had uh, managed Temple Moore or you, you were working in there yourself. So do, do you see this new role as an opportunity to, to try and bring about even greater greater equality within Angarda Siakana? Absolutely. And I think the big thing for me is not to just take it for granted, you know, and to be able to acknowledge to people that, look, at, you know, I joined as a guard and I did this, that and the other thing. And people find that really interesting, you know, all the steps along the way. So and I think the big thing really is to give time to people or, you know, to have the conversations, whether that's in a public forum like this or whether it's on, in one to one conversations. But um, and I think um, the importance of just being humble about it and just being, you know, um, OK, on one level, it's a, it's a massive ach- achievement. But on the other hand, it didn't happen overnight. And there are so many steps along the way. And each one of them is, is a, an achievement and a, a celebration in its own right. So I just think it's important to break things down into bite-sized pe- pieces for people. And uh, certainly if somebody said to me, you know, um, when I joined in Garda Shikana that I would end up where I currently am. I mean, it, it just wouldn't even have been in my wildest dreams. Or even along the way, if somebody had suggested it, I would equally say the same thing. But, you know, I, I suppose for me, I, you know, I just want to say that I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of, of my time in Garda Shikana. There's so many opportunities. Yes, there are downtimes and there's challenges and there's all of those things. But you know what? You bounce back from them and, you know, you move on again. And, uh, you know, I just the variety in the role is really something that, you know, would appeal to a lot of people. And I think that's why we get such high caliber um, people joining on Garda Shikana and today's International Women's Day. So in particular, the high caliber of women, really well educated from a variety of, of backgrounds. And, and we want to do more to encourage, I suppose, that variety of, of backgrounds that's represented in on Garda Shikana because every every perspective is important, you know, I suppose you know, ultimately we want to be representative of the society that we're policing. And I suppose that's something, a particular focus for me, uh, particularly uh, in my role as uh, chairing the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion uh, Council. So, um, yeah, so lots of opportunities as well. Your, your advice to young women is to take it step by step and obviously to, to, to aim high and, and to, to take it day by day. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose the key thing for me is taking the opportunities that present, you know, and uh, sometimes, you know, um, we don't always see the opportunity in certain things that are presented, you know, because they mightn't be the most high profile, but there's an opportunity in everything. And every every step you take, there's another door that opens, you know. So um, I just think it's it's important to be open to 
to you know to all the, the various things that come along the way, all the opportunities, and taking them with both hands really and making the most of them. And certainly that's what I did. I mean, I got lots of opportunities. You know, I had you know before I joined the guards, I had no third qualification. I had nobody belonged to me in the guards, and I've just paved the way and with a lot of support from a lot of people. And and in the beginning, certainly they were in the majority male. Um, you know, so I think it's important to acknowledge that as well, that, um, you know, that it isn't, you know, it isn't just female colleagues that, that support us, it's our male colleagues as well. And in particular, say, 34 years ago or 30 years ago, you know, that was, uh, you know, it was quite a brave step, I suppose, really not surprising. But at the same time, uh, it, it's important to acknowledge it. Absolutely. I, I think the only way that we, we reach that that level of equality it's not just women championing women but men championing women as well and not thinking that we're, we're just there to take over and that it's about uh, it's about creating things all equal um but you know you said take opportunities and and take things as they come Maeve um you're, you're uh, CEO of the, the property services regulatory authority and I'm just wondering how has your career progressed is it that you, you took opportunities or is it that things came your way that you didn't expect or how, how have things progressed for you along your career? I think um, quite similar to what we've heard from previous speakers um, joined civil service at a very young age um, at the TCT grade, which was more formally known as the yellow pack grade and um, really got great experience actually from that um, had an opportunity then to come back into the civil service at the clerical assistant grade and really worked hard, worked, worked my way up the different various promotions. And like what we've heard today, got great support and guidance and advice from both, uh, both male and female um, bosses and great encouragement. Um, and I suppose made aware, you know, along my career of opportunities that might be available to me at, at different levels uh, uh, of, of, in the civil service. I had great opportunities to go abroad uh, representing the department on various programmes um, had a, an opportunity, a great opportunity at Har with Harvard Executive. Um, the department provided me with a, a time and study leave and everything to go off and do my degree and eventually my master's in criminal justice. So the department and civil service has, has been a very um, um, powerful and a very um, um, great opportunity, provided me with great opportunities and has really brought me along the path. Would I have thought where I was today? Absolutely not. No way would I have thought I'd be in a regulatory role. You know, some days a lot of carrot and, and, and unfortunately other days uh, stick as well, where we, you know, we have to impose sanctions and, you know, we have the we have very strong powers going before the high court and, and seeking um, suspension of people's licenses from trading. So um, if you told me that's where I would uh, be today, I wouldn't have even dreamed of it. But I suppose when you a bit like Una, we I think we're, we're, we're we 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 parallel careers in in ways. Uh, we, having worked in Leinster House together, um, having come up the various ranks together, we've we've seen an awful lot of change in the Department of Justice and the, the justice sector. Like Amria said in the, in the guards, I've worked in the guard inspectorate, got a great insight into um, uh, the 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 role of Angarda Shiakon and and the challenges facing it. And I remember, um, I suppose I should uh, remember, I got um, speaking about resources and people, um, women going on maternity leave and the gap that posed for people. And I remember Assistant Commissioner uh, Mick Finn saying to me, Maeve, perspective, perspective. And, and it has stuck with me today as manager. Um, the, they come back and they come back, you know, with uh, they bring back great attributes, you know, they've great organizational skills, a can do act, act, uh, attitude, you know, uh, if there's problems, yeah, let, let's see how we will fix it. And he also uh, <laughs> informed me that his his wife then was in charge of nursing in the Cork Regional Hospital. And he said, you think you've problems try and deal with the, the, the uh, women going on maternity leave and availing family friendly policies. And I suppose from that, what I've taken is that, look, we do face problems, we face challenges, but 
if you uh, support your staff and I'm very strong on supporting staff and like we've heard here today, encouraging people to avail of those opportunities. And do you know what? If you don't succeed the first time, you might succeed the second and you definitely will succeed the third time. You gain so much experience and, and understanding of what's expected at interview level. Like, you know, they're not easy to prepare for and, you know, fill out that application. Like I, I can, I spend a lot of time helping people complete their application um, and, you know, just that gives them a level of confidence going in to uh, compete on a, on a level playing field with both men and women. And uh, hopefully, you know, they have done well. I'm delighted some people do that. And it's great to see women, you know, do well at uh, interview, particularly if they say to you, I, I don't want to apply. I don't want to go before an interview board. Um, sure, I, I won't know what to say. And you know what? They, they, they're, they're, they're fantastic um, role models for other uh, junior staff then in, in the organisation. You know what? Give it a go. See how you get on. And you know what? Uh, I might get lucky. And there is a lot of luck involved. You get the right question or, you know, you've a bit of experience that's required for a particular role. Um, so look, the civil service has been very good to me and um, I'm, I would be delighted to recommend uh, a career in civil service uh, to anybody interested in joining. Do you see your role as a, as a regulator, as um, a role that can encourage more women into this profession, into auctioneering or do, do you see a particular role there with, within your current um, current role? You're managing a team of people, obviously. Yeah, I suppose um, the 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 PSRA uh, we have um, regulatory inspectors. That's one of our of our, of our roles. The sector itself really is broken down. Just looking at the stats, like um, state agents, like two to to one, um, are are there's a very heavy balance there of males. It seems you know it is a male dominated uh, uh, sector, but. There's a number of policies happening and I can see more and more women coming into it. It's a career that lends itself very nicely to women wishing to come back in and maybe work part time or work Saturdays or um, undertake, you know, uh, week on week off roles. It just lends itself very well to that. And a lot of women are attracted to it. Um, a lot of the women um, in, in the sector really are kind of you, you'll see them in the back office. A very strong support to and ensuring that the, the, the business operates really on a, on a very good effect of professional level um, but one of the recent um, additions is to recruiting in, um, estate agents need to be licensed so there's a lot of uh, the course now are online which is great for people that you know have families and don't feel that they need to travel have to travel to long distance to attend college and get their qualification and more recently we've introduced an apprenticeship program which has been really a, a, a very well attended by women who are currently working in estate agents and want that step up want to promote their own abilities and get get licensed and that that will uh, give them more opportunities to uh, within the sector. And, and we're seeing as a result of that uh, applications coming in now for women wanting to open up their own businesses. So that's really great to see. And I'm really encouraged by that and uh, really support, um, you know, women that want to start up the business because that, again, it's a challenge in itself. Not alone have you the regulation of the PSRA to worry about. You'll also, if they're setting up company, company laws and they, you know, there's a lot of, uh, and again, I suppose the, the organizational skills of women really, it lends itself very well to women opening up in business and succeeding. Well, you, you've highlighted the fact that we need to be flexible and, and that we need to, 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 you know, acknowledge that everybody has a different objective or, or maybe their, their, their wants or their needs are, are different and we need to be able to, no matter what uh, role we work in or no matter whether it's the justice sector or otherwise, that we can create and provide that flexibility. And I think that in itself will, will help us bring about uh, much greater equality as well. Um, Linda, if I could ask maybe, and, and um, I suppose, an unusual question, but maybe thinking back to your your ten year old self, you're you're the the chief state pathologist at the moment. But when when you were ten or when you were younger, you know, is this is this a role that you ever saw yourself in, or how how did that progress? I know you've travelled a lot as well. Did that influence your career, or you know, where did you see yourself when you were ten in comparison to to where you are now? When I was 10, I was sort of, uh, it was very much school and soccer and Irish dancing. And that was kind of the, the crux of my life at that point. Um, but I suppose in school, I was always, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a very different civil servant, I think, to, to the rest of you guys. 
in that uh, I suppose I'm more kind of science technology and that that aspect but I was always maths and science in school I always veered towards maths and um, it's one of the things you've all highlighted the kind of preconceptions and the barriers there I remember when I was going into secondary school I wanted I really wanted to do science and, and the choice at that stage was between science and home economics and my mother always wanted us to be happy she always wanted us to do what we wanted um, and I said I want to do science you know and she she was very supportive but she just wanted to make sure I was going to be able for it and she went to my primary school teacher who was a man and she said this to him and I, she, to this day I credit him with how I've ended up here because he told my mother what are you even thinking about sure you can teach her to boil an egg at home <laughs> and that's what he said to my mother and since that day I literally science I just took hold of science with both hands and I, I just that's where I went and I knew by the time I was most of the way through college that I wanted to do medicine because I, I went to the UCD open day so um I suppose then what influenced me was obviously you know like everybody hooked on CSI and all the detective shows and that sort of influenced me towards that but I found that even I did a few years clinical medicine and I worked for two years in Australia which was brilliant and Australia is you know they're they're almost way ahead of us in a, in a lot of things and particularly in the healthcare system and it was so very well managed and very evenly balanced it really was a great example for me and how to approach my career in general and so I tried to bring a lot of that back when I started working as a histopathologist here and um, I mean then again you know Prof Cassidy was always one of my mentors and role models and I was extremely lucky to end up um, being able to work with her so you know I was I think the common theme with everybody uh, here is that I had a lot of support at home um, I had a great family support and that really was what made me take the opportunities and you know progress myself along that path but I never really thought I'd end up right here right now but there you go <laughs> here we are can I ask and you, you, you touched on something which is still I think an issue that we don't have enough uh, girls getting involved in science and technology and engineering and in career paths that maybe are, are seen as uh, still quite male dominated what advice would you have to to anyone um, I know we have some of we have students and everybody joining us today. What advice would you would you give to any of our students who are thinking on this type of a career path? Yeah, so I mean, just don't be caught up by preconceptions and um, particularly your own preconceptions and, and just have that extra bit of confidence in your abilities. You know, you shouldn't be intimidated in what is perceived to be a male dominated world because very often the men are intimidated because you have the same skill set. So, it, you know, the you have to just get to know your colleagues and try and work with them as a team and forget about men, women or whatever, and just, just pr try and get over those preconceptions that are that are kind of socially and culturally uh, built in. Um, but I mean, medicine in particular has progressed quite a long way. A lot of the, the training schemes nowadays in hospitals have an option of flexible training, which actually is one of the things I undertook when I was training. So for three years, I did half-time training. So I did a six month training period within one year. And so that allowed me then to spend time with my family. Um, and it was amazing because it just that flexibility um, allowed me to spend time studying and spend time working towards the goals that I needed to achieve, uh, which I wouldn't have had otherwise, you know. And I think the civil service, when you know, the one thing that was always emphasized to me when I started here was have that support, have your, your family and always keep your interests outside of work. Um, and that's something that you really do need to maintain. Don't don't lose yourself in your in your quest for for progression, um, but but don't be limited by preconceptions. And maybe I have questions because we have a few coming in, and I don't want to be hogging it all. But um, Kira Carberry has asked: as a woman working at the highest level, do you often find that you're the only woman on a panel or in a forum where decisions are being made? I don't know, Linda, if 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 you wanted to answer that first, just when we're still talking. Um, yeah, I mean, we would do a lot of advisory work from a forensic point of view. I mean, things like most recently would be the mortality oversight group for the COVID-19 response. But I do find that, um, I have to say, it's been fairly evenly balanced. I mean, a lot of the, the coroners now would be women and the, 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 the kind of busier coroners would be women and they had a lot of input. So um, it's still there. I mean, the, the, the men are chairing the committees and the men are directing the committees and um, so yeah that that probably is still a big thing but you know I think we are all progressing I think that will change eventually I don't know what everybody else's experience was. I might fire that up into anyone else if you know if you want to 
I'd say Anne Marie has I'd say Anne Marie has more experience in this than anyone else. But, but I'd say it's happened to us all. Uh, Anne Marie, do you want to come in on that? Well, to be fair, I would say um things are changing. And uh, if I look at my own role, uh, I, you know, I'm chairing a whole lot of groups and whatever else. And it, it's really about getting the job done as opposed to anything else really and making the decisions and, and uh, making things happen. And, uh, and I suppose it's encouraging that, um, you know, whether the, the, the chair is male or female, I would say is probably no longer an issue to be fair. I was, I was going to say, Minister, I remember, I think it's important to, for us to use our chairs to reinforce people um, when they do come to meetings and when junior people do come along. Because for years, I was either the only woman or the youngest person in the room quite a lot of the time. And like other other colleagues did say to me, that was a good question. You were right to ask that question. Stuff like that, but did still even carry around with you to this day, you know, rather than just sitting like a shrinking wallflower. I see another question there about in, imposter syndrome. And my thing about imposter syndrome is that we all have it. Everybody has it. Like if, if the people I mentioned earlier have it, and I certainly have it in spades, you know, everybody feels this way. It's just most people don't talk about it a lot. And I, I just think we need to, to realise that and that everybody's intimidated by something. And, you know, you just kind of need to, to put on your put on your best smile and, and, and fake it till you make it a little bit as well. But also believe in yourself. Absolutely. Well, that's something I was always asked when I started in, in politics, if I felt I was treated differently because I was a woman. Um, and I have to say it was mainly the fact that I was young. I think people looked at me differently and, and felt that, well, she doesn't have the experience. She doesn't have the knowledge. She's she's not able to do her role. So I'm sure many younger people feel that the same as well. So it's, it's about challenging that. And obviously everybody has to learn. Everybody has to 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 to. to, to Garner experience and, and that feeds into to their careers in general but um, Nolene Blackwell has asked a, a very good question um, and thanks Nolene as public servants all with significant influence uh, which which you do what are the main values or ideas that help you come to decisions um, so I might fire that at Angela if that's okay but I suppose um, when you're making your decisions what, what what are the motivations or what what are the values that, that underpin those decisions well, it's back to public service, I think, first and foremost, if you look at, you know, COVID is the classic example, almost this day last year, I think it was the 12th of March this year, I sat in this room with um, senior uh, people from right across the legal sector, trying to figure out what were we going to do and you know, it, it, go, it does, it goes back to those core public service values of serving the citizen. Um, treating people equally and treating people fairly in the court services um, in, in, you know, we have to be, we are impar impartial. That's key to us that the courts don't take a side. Um, so you go back to those and certainly from my own perspective, it's about doing the right thing as opposed to doing things right. Um, and I know that sounds kind of odd, but it is about that. It's what is the right thing to do um, on the 12th of March last year, you know, we knew that the right thing to do was to keep the doors of our courthouses open because that's essential for society. And thereafter it was, you know, how do you go about keeping it open to the maximum ex extent possible while keeping people safe? And if you if you take that, you know, any decision that I make at the, at the table here, it is about that. And I'm very lucky, um, the team here, we're also 50-50 at principal officer level. We had more women than men there for a short time at the, the management team. Um, and it is about that. It's about trying to include as many voices in the room as well when you make those decisions. We all think back to the banking crisis and some would say that an absence of women in the room when those key decisions were made uh, probably didn't help things. Um, and it, it is about that. It's about getting the different perspectives into the room and, and hearing those different voices and giving everybody a, an equal hearing. And, and you consider all of those, but it's back to the core public service values. At the end of the day, um, we're here to serve the public, serve them fairly, equally, impartially, and to treat people as well as we can. Look, if you look at the courts, for example, 
half the people who come to court are going to lose because it's an adversarial system. There's a winner and there's a loser. But it's that people, as they move, go through that experience, have the best experience possible and to make it as easy to access as possible. That's key. Um, and you, look, I go back to COVID and the domestic violence, the surge in domestic violence. And that was one of the priorities that we had at that time to protect the most vulnerable in society. The lists that stayed going the whole way through were the lists that serve the most vulnerable members of society, domestic violence, war, and so on. Um, and I suppose that's when you're making your decisions, that's where you come from, um, you know, at the end of the day. And it's about, it is about doing the right thing at the it's end It's also of the day. to be aware of your biases when you're actually in a room and making decisions that you kind of know what your biases are, park them and ensure fair, fair, fairness for everybody um, when you are coming to that decision that you're making it on fact and that your professional and a, a public sector values key uh, key aspect also but your professional and that you can deliver a fact-based decision that will stand up to challenge anywhere so you can't be because you're a woman you made a decision in a particular way and uh, that you can you really stand over and defend it I agree with with, with that. Uh, would just um, a great question from Nolene. And I think one of the things I ask myself all the time, and I suppose it goes back to that imposter syndrome, is do, do I know what I need to know about this? Or is there somebody else I need to talk to that knows more about this than I do? Uh, and somebody who, whose experience I need to hear from. And actually, the first time I ever met Nolene was when I went to talk to her about a, a debt, uh, piece of legislation on debt that we were that we were working on. And the the... The, the insight that Flack brought to that that I could never have, have read, if you know what I mean. Uh, so that, that's one of our core values is that collaborative openness uh, to, to hearing from others and to doing that consistently as much as we can. Uh, Minister, if I could, I just see another question there about encouraging people outside the department to apply for jobs. And while we have this platform, I'd certainly like to do to take the opportunity to do that. But also just to say that we have so many people in the department as well who've come in from outside the organisation. I know you have a few lifers here on the screen in front of you at the moment, but there, there's there's a range of people working in the department from a, a mass of backgrounds from from science and STEM, um, like like uh, like colleagues here, but also from yeah, from media, from NGOs who've worked in um, in the UK. We've quite a lot of people who've come since Brexit was announced in 2016, both from the UK civil service, but also from other experiences in the UK. So certainly not a closed shop by any manner of means. And uh, come and join us. We're a great place to work. Brilliant. There we go. Your your plug in for the ads. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But no, you, you mentioned, and, and I'm going to ask this question if I could, just in the short time we've left, but uh, you mentioned, obviously, speaking to other people, getting other views, other opinions. But if I could ask each and every one of you, what is the best piece of advice that you have maybe received or been given throughout your career? And, and what would you then pass on or would, would you pass that on then to, to, to those who are listening? So maybe I'll, I'll go to Anne-Marie if that's OK. I think the, the most important piece of advice that I got was to, to value yourself and be yourself, you know, uh, and bring yourself to whatever it is that you're doing. And, you know, the, the, you know that remaining true is really important and um, bringing your, you know, your own values. And, we all, you know, we're all shaped by how we're brought up and, you know, uh, the nurturing and so forth that we get all along the way. So... That has always stuck with me, that whole notion of being yourself. Brilliant. And something to be passed on to, to, to the next generation of Garda Siakana. Um, Linda, maybe I'll ask you. Um, probably two things. The first one was uh, manners cost nothing. Uh, and I think um, trying to get along positively with everybody uh, tends to get you further than if you're aggressive or, or, or stubborn, which you know, we're all prone to sometimes. Um, the other thing was, uh, I don't, don't, I wouldn't be big into this self-help uh, stuff, but I, I was recommended a book called Mindset one time, and it literally changed the way I thought about how to approach problems. And it's just all about um, positive mindset. And, you know, you like, like everybody's been saying here, you break down the problems into smaller pieces and you take it step by step. It just is a really simple, but very useful book. So uh, it's one I'd recommend. Brilliant. Una? Uh, don't apply for jobs uh, only apply for jobs that you want don't apply for jobs you don't want because it's much easier to do something that you love than something that you don't love and it's much better to be good at it and much easier to be good at it 
Um, and the, the other thing is a bit like Linda's, it's, it's kindness translates. So uh, that to be kind is, uh, it comes back to you again and again in spades, um, a little bit of kindness. Great, good advice. Um, Maeve? I suppose two or three years ago on International Women's Day, I listened to a former sec gen who outlined her struggle to get to the top. And it was, you know, it was very easy that if to to listen to listen to her struggles and understand her struggles. So really, what I took away from that really is keep going, go for it. A bit like going to go for what you want. Be careful what you want, but keep that, keep at it. Uh, don't be dis, uh, discouraged. Um, keep going, and and you will get there. Brilliant. And Angela, I'll ask you. I thing. have. I have three pictures on my wall here of kind of smiley girls faces and one of them says be brave, one says be kind and the last one says be yourself. Lovely. Yeah, and, and it, the commonality in that message is, um, you know, it really is. And there are days when I sit here and I go, which one of those do I need to be today? But um, it they are the three keys you can keep those be yourself and I completely agree with Una I come into work every day and it's not a it's not a chore it's not a job because I love it um and it, it's much easier to do something when you do love it so um if you enjoy it stick at it yeah Brilliant. Well, look, there was another question here but I think you've answered it so Dolores O'Connor who says what advice do you recommend I give to my 10 year old daughter who is sitting opposite me doing her homework at the moment how do I give her the confidence to succeed as you all have done? And I think really, you know, the, the advice that you've been given, but Angela, as you, you've summed it up probably of all five speakers that be brave, be kind, be yourself. Um, and, and I suppose one thing that I would add to it is, is never be afraid to, to, to reach for the stars. And it might sound like mm-hmm. a cliche, but, you know, it's anything is possible. And, and that's why it's so important that we have these type of forums, uh, be it an International Women's Day or any other kind of day to 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 make sure that we, I suppose, we, we can see who we want to be. And so many of you have achieved so much over the last number of years. And I just want to sincerely thank you um, for your time this afternoon. There was one last question. I'm not sure we'd we, we get to come round to it but maybe if we have two minutes and that was just to come back to the theme for this year's International Women's Day Choose to Challenge so uh, I, I have 30 seconds for each of you but if you were to do one thing in the next day in the next week in the next year to, to improve things for their women what would that be and I'll open it up to whoever wants to wants to answer that Often I'm asked to go on um, as a judge of, of property uh, competitions and I'm very strong on using that platform to promote um, uh, women as part of, you know, acknowledging their contribution, their ability. Um, and uh, often, you know, you, you can uh, see it's uh, the men that come to the top, it's the men that are winning the competitions. But I'm very strong on just focusing that doing, uh, ensuring that women are, are, are seen and heard um, when it comes to prize giving. Brilliant. Angela? It's about creating that ena- that enabling environment so that when people want to make the decisions about their careers um, into the future, that the, they can take the opportunities they're given at that time in their lives. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's what's important. It's about it's about creating that environment where um, people can, can choose their own career path. And I think that's going to underpin what we're trying to do in the future in our people and organization strategy, because that's the key. It's about having the choices at the right time in your, both your home life and your, your work life. You can't separate the two. You're, you're only the one person. So you, it's difficult to separate the two. And it's about giving people those choices and, and putting the, the building blocks in place to allow people to make the decisions that they want to make about their own careers. Brilliant. I'll hand over to our two or three. So Linda, maybe just where do you see the next year for yourself? I'm coming from a, the, the prospect of having an all female forensic pathology team here this year. So, so we're, we're, we're heading that direction, which is great. Um, but, you know, I, I always think challenging these type of um, issues starts in the, in the home, like Angela has said, and, you know, starting off from the very beginning with people, you know, and people, your children and just saying, there aren't any men, women, everybody should have equal opportunities. And, you know, we've talked a lot about women, but, you know, we should have equal maternity leave, shared paternity leave, all of that kind of stuff needs to be ironed out. And that's a bigger picture. But if you start your home and just challenge the men, women roles and right from the start, I think that's a really important thing that every one of us can do. 
Good. Maternity leave is topical at the moment, but I won't. Congratulations, by the way. I suppose the, the key thing to me is, you know, just saying, well, why not? You know, so in various conversations with various, you know, various um, people, you know, rather than saying, outlining reasons why, you know, somebody can't, well, you know, I think the challenge really is, well, why not? You know, and I think, you know, when you when you have the pros and cons, then it's very easy to make the decision. Brilliant. And Una, I look forward to working with you in the year ahead. I would just say, I suppose we, we'll be challenged, we'll be continuing to challenge ourselves and each other every day, Minister, as we do at the moment uh, on, on the range of policy things, but also, I suppose, taking into account uh, the, the our own learning and, and looking at mat leave and so forth, what we can do to support uh, colleagues around the organisation, both in, in uh, during their maternity leave and, and returning to the workplace after their mat leave. And just to say, this is something that benefits everyone, like it benefits men and women in the organisation if, if our organisation and our country and our policies are, are as equal and that we're getting the best out of the talent that we have available to us. We just can't continue to ignore a, a good proportion of the talent. So making life uh, as easy for people to contrib contribute all their talents is what we're all about. Brilliant. Well, look, we, we've only got a minute or two over, but I just want to thank each and every one of you for your time and, and really your, your inspirational words. I, I said at the beginning, I really do feel very lucky to be Minister for Justice at a time when we have such wonderful women working in this sector and, and you are breaking through many glass ceilings, but but you really are uh, an inspiration to so many young women coming down. I think uh, we're fairly lucky too, ladies, aren't we, to have <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to everyone for joining in. Um, happy International Women's Day and we'll hopefully see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.